The multi-part documentary, The Jinx, concludes with off-camera audio of Robert Durst seemingly confessing to murder. He made the comments during a follow-up interview with filmmaker Andrew Jarecki at the conclusion of the series. Jarecki presents Durst with a letter that he admits he wrote to his friend Susan Berman months before her murder in 2000. No one was ever charged. The handwriting on Durst's letter is similar to an anonymous letter police received alerting them to the location of her body. There is much more to Robert Durst than most people would ever realize. First, he is not, as some news services have indicated in the last few days, the lead singer of Limp Biscuit. Second, he is probably about as crazy as the proverbial fox. And third, a closer examination of the Ice in Veins family he comes from might lend some thought to why he is the way that he is. Our guest is special correspondent with The Daily Beast, a Pulitzer Prize finalist, multiple author. He tackles the Durst family in his article, The Durst Family's Tower of Suffering, on the Daily Beast website available now. Let's welcome Michael Daly to Midpoint. Michael, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. What is the truth about this Durst family? Because as you point out very early in your article, this man had a wife that went missing in the Durst family. It was almost as if, well, don't worry about a thing. Everything will be just fine. It's, it's a fascinating family. Well, her family, uh, the McCormick family, says that the uh, Durst patriarch never once called the missing woman's mother. I mean, you'd think that, well, let's say you, your son's daughter went missing all of a sudden. You'd think, you know, that just simplest decency would have you at least reach out to her family and tell you that you know you share their concern and you hope that she's found and it's terrible that she's missing and the corner family said they never heard a word it really would it's seem really to be what you would expect though because isn't the durst family as far as their business is concerned they are known as i quoted them the ice in the veins type and the real estate people out there they don't care what happens to durst this time all they care about is their real estate holdings are solid well, it would seem, it certainly would seem that way. Um, and if you look at the, the Durst organization is now in charge of One World Trade Center, um, which the Freedom Tower that rose at the site of the 9-11 attacks. And in front of the building are two memorial pools bearing the names of all those who were killed, including more than a thousand who are still as missing as Mr. Durst's wife. And if you look at their website, which anybody so inclined can do, you'll see that they make no mention of the memorial, that they describe the area of the memorial for these thousands of murdered innocents as a tree-filled park. <laughs> Let me ask you this, Mike, a couple minutes that we have left here. Is Robert Durst crazy, or is, as I said, is he just crazy like a fox? Well, <laughs> I think that he... If he did what he is suspected of doing, I think he probably started out a little bit nuts and uh, drove himself considerably further along the road. Um, you know, he was found talking to himself outside the elevators, and you wonder, well, who else could he talk to? Um, <laughs> uh, really, I mean, if you had a, a beautiful, nice wife who's in medical school and she goes missing, and then uh, your neighbor gets found in pieces in Galveston Bay. And you're also suspected of murdering your best friend. So you're suspected of murdering your wife, your best and maybe only friend, and your neighbor. Um, it isn't like a lot of people are going to want to be around you and uh, seek your thoughts. Yeah, not very much. I got less than a minute left here. Do you think that the law enforcement agencies really needed HBO to do this? That just seems rather odd. Apparently somebody didn't do their job. Well, you have to wonder, the, if you look at Susan Berman's, the crime scene there, it would, it would seem, because there's no one broke in and she got shot in the back of the head, so she wasn't looking around to see who was behind her, you'd think that she, there's a good chance she knew who shot her. So if you have a situation where you have one letter written by someone who's certainly the killer, and the other fact you have is the person, the killer is probably someone she knew, you'd think you'd go through her things looking for handwriting that might match the killer's handwriting. Um, and that second envelope that became really the center of the new case 
was actually among the personal effects that the police turned over to her stepson. So they had that in their possession, and I guess they never looked at it. Something's, Something's not quite right, and we have a ways to go yet in this case. It is only just beginning, and the movie of the week is, of course, right around the corner. Uh, Michael Daly, again, we want to comment you on the article, The Durst Family's Tower of Suffering on the Daily Beast. Thanks for joining us, Mike. Look forward to the next Thanks time. All right, Thank take you. care. Take out a slice of American paper money. Give it a look. Take out several nominations, then tell me what you see. Rather, tell me what you don't see. There's something there. It's coming up next, right here on Midpoint.